I'm taking a closer look at the contemporary design argument for the existence of God. What do contemporary philosophers have to say about the existence of God, taking into account a teleological type of argument, but using contemporary information from science? Now, as a baseline, I'm using an argument from Stephen T. Davis, as he put in his book, God, Reason, and Theistic Proofs. But much of what I'm saying will be from other sources, including from Peter Van Inwagen, Richard Swinburne, Robert Collins, other people who have written on this topic. And so, uh, of course, bottom line is I'm responsible for any mistakes but I'm, I'm following the reasoning of many other philosophers as well as Davis. Okay, what's, what's the overview? What's going on here? Well, uh, normal teleological arguments, uh, the classical versions are looking at biology primarily, but the, the contemporary design argument, the, the focus is on the general order of nature, the fine tuning of the universe as a whole, for beings like us, for, for creatures like us to exist. So the basic idea is that regularities and physical constants are extremely fine-tuned to allow for life to exist. And the best explanation of that fine-tuning is an intelligent designer of the universe, who would be, of course, God. So let's take a closer look on how this argument is put together using those main ideas. We have as a premise that the universe is fine-tuned to support life. This is something that has come to be supported over the last 50 years by physicists and cosmologists, uh, people who study the origin of the universe. So the idea of fine-tuning is the idea that it is is extremely improbable that a universe capable of supporting life exists. And the best explanation for this extreme improbability is intentional design by an intelligent being. And of course, we conclude from that that the universe was in fact intentionally designed by an intelligent being and what else might we be talking about but the being we know as God. Now, premise one is supported by facts about the universe and other scientific developments in various fields over the last 30, 40, I should say, even 50 or 60 years. And the second premise is based on the obvious need to explain this improbability. Whether or not it needs explained is something we would pick up in a second video on criticisms of this design argument. Now, put it into context into other arguments for the existence of God. Here we're talking about general physical fine-tuning as found in physics, astronomy, and chemistry. These are the things that are emphasized in the contemporary design argument, or the CDA, over biological complexity, which might be explicable by evolutionary theory. And so uh, there are few, if any, appeals to specific design purposes. So the traditional or, or modern teleological argument, that of Paley, for example, appeals to the structure of the eye as if it were designed to see by an intelligent being, right? That's the idea behind the modern teleological argument. Knees that are designed to bend so that humans can walk around those kinds of things. This argument does not make appeals to those kinds of things. Instead, uh, it appeals to contemporary physics. Also, the structure of the reasoning in the CDA is different. The contemporary arguments are predominantly arguments to the best explanation, and the modern arguments are primarily arguments by analogy. Now, that's not to say we won't use some analogy to help illustrate the contemporary design argument. Okay, fine-tuning. We've mentioned fine-tuning, that the universe is fine-tuned. What does this mean? Think initially of an, musical instruments, like a guitar, something with strings, a piano. 
there is only a very narrow range of tension on each individual string that allows for the instrument to play music properly. So with a guitar, you have knobs at the neck to adjust the tension on the string. And if you were to just take a guitar that's tuned, but then hand it to somebody and tell them to randomly turn the knobs any way they want to, any direction they want to, give it a good twist, a full rotation or, or a half, whatever you want to do, clearly that will put the guitar out of tune. It will be unplayable at least until it's tuned up again. Every other degree of tension but that very narrow range will put the instrument out of tune. So that's, that's the idea of what we're talking about with fine tuning. We're using this idea that we find with musical instruments and of course, other instruments have to be tuned as well, but I think it comes across more clearly when we're talking about strings like we have with a piano or a guitar. Another background that sometimes I've found authors overlook and kind of skip over are the necessary requirements for living organisms to exist. The argument really doesn't work without thinking about these things. What does it take? What does the universe have to be like in order for a living organism to exist? What things are necessary? Well, one, there has to be matter that can form complex relationships, right? For an organism to be alive, even by the name living organism, you have to have matter that can be organized and it has to have complex relationships. If you think simply about DNA, for example, and the complexity of the, the double helix and the protein molecules that fit together to make DNA possible, there has to be complex relationships going on, even at that low level and obviously at a higher level as well. There has to be a stable physical environment for living organisms to exist. So, for example, a planet that was very near a star and rotated on the axis, say, every 10 hours. So you have 10 hour days and it had a, a very little, if any, atmosphere. Such a planet would go from extremely hot temperatures to extremely cold temperatures rapidly, right? Day, night would shift every five hours. It would be an extreme change. Now, you can't have that for living organisms to exist. Well, we're not only talking about temperature. We're talking about radiation and light and gravitational pull that has to be stable in order for there to be a, an environment in which a physical living organism could exist. A third thing is a consistent source of energy. We all need energy, living organisms need energy to exist. So plants from the sun, and obviously we eat the plants that rely on the sun, or some of us eat meat from animals that eat plants that rely on the sun. So the sun for us is the ultimately the bottom line consistent source of energy for the living organisms to exist on our planet. Now that could be something else. So there are some creatures that uh, live in the deep ocean that might rely on heat from the center of the earth that's consistent, but there has to be a consistent source of energy somehow. And these three are merely some minimal requirements. Obviously you can have all three of these things without living organisms existing, but these have to be present. You have to have all three of these things in order for living organisms to exist. Now, as it turns out, the universe must be finely tuned to allow for all three of these things to exist. Now, what, what are we talking about? What things need to be fine-tuned? Well, I'm not a physicist, obviously, but I'll go through just a few basic ideas from contemporary cosmology and physics. Uh, one would be the rate of expansion of the universe after the Big Bang. So contemporary physics says there was a Big Bang about 13 to 14 billion years ago. And at that point in time, the universe began to expand. And it had began to expand at a certain rate. Now, if the rate of expansion had been more rapid, 
there wouldn't be any gases at all. You wouldn't have molecules or, well, even atoms that could form stars, for example. And you wouldn't have planets and you wouldn't have galaxies. None of those things would form, which would, without those things, would eliminate those three things that are required for living organisms to exist, right? We wouldn't have the matter that can form a complex relationship or a consistent source of energy or uh, a stable physical environment. Now, if we went the other direction and the rate of expansion were slower, there would be too much gravitational attraction and that would have meant that the universe would have collapsed into one big black hole. And so either one of these would result in three essential features for life being absent. And so the rate of expansion of the universe had to be just right. It had to be finely tuned. The strong force is another thing that had to be finely tuned. This is what holds neutrons together with protons in the nucleus of an atom and quarks within the neutrons and proteins protons rather and this strong force is obviously essential for atoms to work at all and if it were stronger by one percent or more you would only have heavier elements if there were any elements at all you wouldn't have any hydrogen and and the problem there is without hydrogen you don't have stars you don't have consistent sources of energy and if it were weaker by one percent or more you wouldn't have any elements except hydrogen. And of course, if all you had were hydrogen, you couldn't construct anything, right? The, the, you couldn't have anything that's forming a complex relationship. So that would be problematic as well. The weak nuclear force is what's relevant for radioactivity, uh, fission, and even more significantly, fusion. And fusion is the basis for energy from the sun. Now, if the weak force were stronger by just a little bit, we wouldn't have any lighter elements like hydrogen, and we wouldn't have any uh, fusion-powered stars, which of course is going to be problematic for providing those three essential features that need to be there for living organisms to exist. Now, if it were weaker, all we would get was helium and uh, we wouldn't have those complex relationships that are required for living organisms. Isotropy, this is the fourth one. We'll, we'll, we'll quit after this one. We'll mention a few more, but, but this is the last one we'll go into details about. Isotropy is the level of evenness of the distribution of background energy or temperatures in the universe. The, the evenness of the spread of the energy and the matter throughout the universe it, it varies by only one part in 100,000 throughout the universe. So, right, anywhere you look up in the night sky, you see stars. It's, they're evenly spread out, roughly. If we were to put this on a 10-point scale, uh, you wouldn't have any readings even close to 9.9 .9 or 10.1. It would have to be in that range of 10. And if there were more isotropy, the things would be too spread out, right? The, the galaxies couldn't form. The early universe would have been destroyed by heat. If there were less isotropy, then uh, things would be too clumped together. Matter would have collapsed into black holes, and that would, again, be an environment where no physical being, living organism, could exist. Now, uh, we've, we've considered those four. Uh, there are many other things that are relevant that need to be finely tuned. The gravitational constant, the speed of light, the mass, the charge of electrons, other properties of subatomic particles, the list goes on. Some people put 15 things on the list, other people put up to 50 things on the list that need to be just right in order for living organisms to exist. And a, as a result of these oddities that we've talked through and other oddities, this all put together makes for a more impressive cumulative case. And one way of thinking about this is 
This is something that I think Robert Collins uh, first came up with, but I've seen it in, in a few different places. It's the universe is kind of like a machine with 30 dials, each dial numbered one through 1000, and each has to be set precisely. So like the first dial has to be set at 942, and the second dial has to be set at 37, and the third dial has to be set at 557, and, and so on and so on. And if you change the setting on any one of those dials, you mess something up, so that you don't have an environment suitable for living organisms to exist. That's the idea. Now, if we take that math seriously, then the probability of a universe conducive to rational life, conducive for there being organisms like us humans, the probability would be one times 10 to the negative 30,000. Now, it is more likely, by far more likely, that you would win a Powerball lottery with, after buying one ticket 10 times in a row consecutively, which obviously somebody would conclude that that was fine-tuned. In other words, you were cheating. Something is going wrong. You wouldn't get any payouts after doing that after two or three times uh, because everyone knows that something's up. We'll explore those odds, uh, probabilities, criticisms more in the video on criticisms and responses to the contemporary design argument. So you can watch that video next for more information.